was uh, Mike Lyons. I was known as Mick in the days when I was at Borger High School, but that's another story. Um, I was uh, appointed in, uh, to Borger High School in 1962, and I taught there for four years until 1966. I was at, uh, in the sixth form at school at Percy Jackson's. Um, I had a year to wait before I went to college because of the end of national service. I missed national service, so we had a year to wait before we could go to college. And I was given a job teaching PE at Skello School. And one of the teachers there was Derek Knowles, uh, who taught at Skello Woodwork. And uh, when I left to go to college, three years later, I met him on the North Bridge. And um, he told me that there would be a job at Balby High School if I wanted one. I'd never heard of Balby High School. Um, but uh, he arranged for me to meet the head then, David Wiseman, who became a famous author, author later. And we met and chatted and he gave me the job there and then. We had to go down to the education department to confirm it. But Derek um, and uh, David were so strong in, my, in recommending me that uh, there was no problem. So that's how I started. And I became a jack of all trades. I had to do everything that was thrown my way. My first form was uh, 4F Boys because that was a time when um, the school had changed from being single sex to uh, um, co-educational. And then we had um, a sixth form as well, as it was called. Um, children, pupils who were uh, able to stay on and do two more years. Um, one of whom became my deputy later on in life in another school in Doncaster, uh, Barney Wordsworth. And uh, John Taylor, who was also in that uh, group, became head of Anchorage School at uh, Scoresby, uh, near Scoresby Ridgewood. So there was th those years produced some very, very good pupils. And all in all, it was a good time for me, definitely. The head was David Wiseman, and he, well, a true gentleman, a magnificent uh, guy, really, really liked him. Uh, powerful intellect, powerful personality, uh, knew precisely where he wanted to go and what he wanted to do with the school, uh, and, uh, and appointed some good staff while I was there and before I was there. Um, he left to go to become uh, head of a school in Cornwall at Red Roof, um, and while he was there he wrote uh, quite a number of books, children's books. One which I can remember vaguely was something to do with the ghost of Jeremy Visick, which I later read to children in school. Um, he was a good man. His daughter uh, also taught in Doncaster. Uh, and I, I can't speak more highly than the, the year I spent with David. He was really a true, true mentor and guide and uh, inspiration to me. A really nice guy. And his deputy uh, was Bob Anderson, who uh, I liked enormously. He was an incredible help to me, uh, and I got on with him famously. And, and for four years, if ever I needed any help, Bob was always there. A really, really good man. Lou Orty was probably the best teacher I'd ever come across at that time in a classroom situation. He was um, absolutely top class, there's no doubt about that. Um, the group of people on the staff who I became friendly with, outside school hours as it were, in the staff room and socially, uh, Jim Webb, who owned um, Stamp Corner and taught art at Borby, Derek Knowles, who I've mentioned before, who did metal work at um, Borby, Nick Chamberlain, who did art, and probably above all, Derek Woodburn, who was my direct um, head of department, who did uh, rural studies and drama. Derek was a great uh, friend and a great colleague, and we became friends for a long, long time. Um, it, both of us friendly after we both left Borby High School, um, and he was uh, another inspiration to me. Harry Taylor, um, I got on with. Harry and I often used to talk about his... Uh, athletic achievements, walking, um, and there were one or two other uh, members of staff I got on with as well. Laurie Waghorn was another one. Um, and Don Scully, who was at um, 
college with me, although I didn't know him very well at college, uh, was also a really good friend. Uh, we started, we worked together in the youth club at, at Balby in one year together, and he was also a very good man to work, to work with. In fact, there were no real weaknesses in the whole staff. The whole place was a, a good one. Joyce Poulter, probably, I didn't know her well enough, but I saw the results of her efforts. She was probably on akin with Luwati in terms of the quality of what she was doing at school. And I think mainly most of the senior teachers, Lou, Joyce, people like that, Derek, Woodburn, they really wanted the children to do well. They wanted them to be uh, better than they probably hoped to be. There may have been a bit of, you know, we're second class because we're not a grammar school. I don't know, I mean, it's difficult to say, but I never felt the staff ever thought like that. They really did want the children to achieve as highly as possible and, and work to do so. And, and that rubbed off on me, I wanted the same. And I always have done. And when I became a head teacher later, that's what I always wanted. I remember those times at Borby, listening to people like Lewarty and Derek Woodburn and, and the way they spoke about children's achievements. So they were an inspiration to me. And David Wiseman again, tremendous help and uh, encouragement to me to, to become what I did become. In those days, grammar schools were for people to become professionals. They were geared, we were geared as pupils. We were told, look, you're in the top 5% of the country academically. You can go on to university, you can become teachers and doctors and lawyers and whatever. And so therefore the, uh, the ambition is to go that way. I don't think that was the same at Borby. The ambitions for children at Borby was to get the best out of what they could. I suppose one of the problems towards the end of children's life there was the fact they knew they could get a job because the new British ropes needed people and peddlers needed people and the plant needed people and there would all to be work for them in those jobs and so some people would probably I can't swear to it but there was probably an element of we don't need to go on and do further education we don't need it because we've got a job um, which is in a way is one of the tragedies of the secondary modern uh, schooling system but those who did stay on as I mentioned earlier uh, did very very well um, you say two became head teachers in Doncaster certainly no I know another one who became a teacher in uh, in Armthorpe Comprehensive uh, Wilson they called him um, and there's some photographs here of boys I took on walking and climbing expeditions and Tony Allen who went to university in Northern Ireland uh, and I think he's got a good job in the professional sense. He stayed on into the sixth form, as we call it. Um, so, yes, uh, there was a difference in attitude, but it wasn't um, inculcated by the teachers. I think it was just culturally different. We had textbooks, basically, uh, and you were duty-bound to follow the textbooks as, as much as possible. But obviously, you need to do something different. You need to make it interesting, not just boring stuff from a book. So therefore, taking my example from Derek, taking my example from Luwati, I tried to put my personality onto the uh, particular subjects. Uh, I don't remember ever being given any formal help towards that. It was get on with it, so to speak. You know, you're a qualified teacher, you're mature enough to work it out for yourself. I think those people who were teaching, uh, obviously for GCSE or CSE later on, um, they were much more restricted in the way in which they could, uh, could do the, the, the curriculum. I remember having to take a year for geography for Derek Holmes, um, again another good teacher who I omitted to mention. Um, Derek said, look this is the book, we have to go through this book. One page was writing, one page was a map. Can you, you know, teach it so that the kids understand the map and, and the writing? And that's what I did. And for a year, I took this class. Um, and Willie Watson was in that class. And I just mentioned the very famous footballer from the, the Rovers. He was in that group of boys we did there. 
Um, but generally speaking, you were pretty well free to develop the stuff you taught any way you wanted. You know, Derek, I don't think Derek Woodburn ever used a textbook. He did everything you know, flamboyantly. He was, he was such a good teacher. And I think Luati would, would be the same. He would be able to teach without even thinking about looking at a textbook. But there were quite a few like that. I think by the 60s, things were beginning to get better. Uh, full employment was everywhere in, in that area. So children were a lot better off. There were obviously some children uh, who were less well off. I suppose from the Waverley area, when I think about it, um, maybe a few from the Hexthorpe area as well. Although generally speaking, I had a lot of time for the Hexthorpe. Hexthorpe kids were in the main very good. Um, we did notice children who we would have liked to have gone camping didn't go because they couldn't afford to and things like that uh, and we tried to do as much as we could in the way of uh, school funds and what have you to uh, pay for those children but it wasn't a, it wasn't as bad as some of the schools that I saw in Huddersfield and Dewsbury um, later in the later 60s Bobby didn't seem to be as bad as that. There were some very poor, very poor mm. children in schools in Dewsbury. Um, I suppose because then work in Dewsbury was becoming more and more unavailable because of the economic situation. Mm. But, ge but generally speaking, I think Bobby kids were okay mm. financially. But there were some poor ones. Mm. Uh, the Beatles changed everything in, in a sense in, in, in those times. Um, the school uniforms were less easy to make kids keep on. They didn't want to wear school uniforms. They used to have to have morning uh, rituals to try and get people to wear them. John Martin, who was by then the head teacher, was very strict on that, but he failed to bring it about properly. Kids grew their hair much longer and they got into trouble because of that. The girls in particular became much more vocal in their attitude towards uh, music and what have you. They all had their favourites. and The Beatles were of course the top of the list of everybody's uh, time at that time. Um, I actually went to see the Beatles at the Baths before they were really quite famous, which really made the girls and, what's it like, what were they like, what were they like, Ooh, what were they like? And all I could tell them was that I didn't think the music was very good, but I liked the way they dressed. <laughs> How wrong was I? <laughs> David Wiseman asked me to um, initiate uh, an idea of how we could attempt to uh, do the Duke of Edinburgh's Award in school, how we could get some of the children to be involved in that particular award. And so I talked to Derek Woodburn, my immediate department head and we discussed it at great length and he was enthusiastic for me to do it um, and to that end we started going away at weekends uh, walking in Derbyshire walking in the uh, Yorkshire Dales and so on and taking children over Stanage in Derbyshire and various other places and then we having started that got the children interested we started camping we took them camping initially for weekends and then gradually uh, we held uh, huge camps in the Easter holidays and in the summer holidays and sometimes in school time as well, which was rather useful. And during that period, I got a group of, of uh, boys, I wasn't allowed to do the girls obviously, a group of boys um, to think about taking the Duke of Edinburgh's award. And in, my, in the first year we took it, four boys uh, managed to get bronze. Uh, but those four boys did very, very well. And then the next group of boys came through and then I left before they were able to carry on. Um, two stories about the camping. First one was the Easter camp we did in Castleton underneath the, the shadow of Mantor in a farm there. Pitched goodness knows how many tents, how many children, I can't remember, but over 50 probably. Derek Woodburn and I were the, the teachers there and we had numerous uh, colleagues uh, Eric Walters, I remember, was one of them, and uh, various friends of friends who came with the kids. And it was a great camp until about the third day when a typhoon came down the valley 
blew all the tents away and we had a big marquee where we dined, which is a dining room and shelter, um, and it blew down. Uh, so it was a massive, tremendous uh, chaos everywhere and looked like we might have to abandon the camp altogether. And the farmer graciously said, don't call it off, let the kids sleep in the barns and the styes and wherever, we can fix it up so they can stay. And we duly did, we wrapped up all the tents, what have you, put them to dry and then we all slept and stayed around the farm. So the farmer was very kind and we had a very good time there and did us all good to realise what you could do mm. in great difficulties. Again, Derek was an uh, inspiration, kept everybody going. Tremendous. And the other story is a bit later on in a camp in Bay's Brown Farm in the Langdale Valley. Again, massive uh, group of children, probably over 50, lots of tents, big marquee, all the, all, the, all the things there. Tremendous. And we got an attack of diarrhoea throughout the camp. An attack so bad most of the children had it and Wally Hebden who was head of PE who was with us said I have been to the toilet 26 times in the last 24 hours which gives you some idea of the scope of the diarrhea that went through the camp we call it dysentery but I suppose it was mm -hmm. and we could never work out what had happened except a little bit later on one of the children whose name I will not tell you but I do know his name said I think it's my fault. What do you mean it's your fault? Well, there was a stream running right through the campsite. Small stream, nothing particularly dodgy, easy enough to jump over, to walk through, to wade through. He said, on the second day we were here, I had diarrhea and I rather messed my trousers and pants. So I went upstream and put them in the water of the stream, weighted them down so they'd wash. And of course, all this diarrhea and stuff washed down the campsite, down the stream. And everybody used the stream for cleaning their teeth in the morning and whatever. So we had dysentery, or as we call it, throughout the, the, the camp. But the one that made me laugh most of all was in the height of this when children were rushing everywhere to try and find a toilet somewhere. And so were the staff as well, for that matter. Mrs. Keithley, who was the head cook and bottom washer, gave us stewed prunes for our pudding one day, <laughs> which didn't go down very well with the kids at all. But it was still a good laugh. Everybody had a good laugh about it. And uh, I'm sure there are children who, who went there, if they're still with us, will remember that for a laugh. <laughs> uh, in the early days, there was a, a, a hut, I suppose, from the war, called, we call it the Annex. It had three classrooms in a rather large classroom, which contained a billiard stroke snooker table and a, an open fire with a, a stove, you know, one of these pot-bellied stoves, a smaller classroom, again with a pot-bellied stove, and then uh, through the, past the entranceway, a further room, which was the technical drawing room, which uh, Mr. Dixon, uh, was it Dixon? I think it was Dixon, Dickinson, I can't remember. He taught in there. The little classroom uh, next to the billiard room was my form room when I first went there. And I had, I think it was 17, 14 year old boys in there as my form. All good lads, nothing wrong with them. Um, and Johnny Hobden, Mr. Hobden, uh, taught art in there when I wasn't in there. And I went, usually went into the next room, the big room, where the billiard table was. And um, that billiard table was the focus point of the lunch times when we had the, maybe half a dozen teachers would come in there with their after dinner coffees and we play snooker and billiards and a lot of laughter went on in that, in that room. Um, so you only developed one personality in there. But it was an interesting building, that the annex. Um, I think towards the end of my career there, I wasn't in, I wasn't using that. I think Derek was, and quite often you would see boys washing cars outside the annex. <laughs> Not mine because I didn't have one. I think I, it, of all the characters I've met in teaching, I think Jim Webb is the one that outstands. Is outstanding. <laughs> um, 
funny, eccentric, tremendous personality. He owned Stamp Corner in town where he sold stamps and what have you and coins and so on. He was an expert on, on that sort of thing. He had been, I think, a physical instructor in the army um, and then came into teaching through PE and then realised he was getting old, he needed another subject. And he taught art and taught it very well indeed. But he had, the kids loved the idea of the whacker. Jim got, I think it might have been Derek Knowles, to make him a whacker, which was um, a device of two pieces of plywood, quite thin ply, about, mm, I'd say three and a half, four inches wide, uh, and inserted one end was a handle which kept them, uh, the two pieces of plywood, apart at the handle, but touching at the ends. And, of course, when applied to the posterior of some unsuspecting child, it made a tremendous noise, but didn't hurt because it was so wide and flat. And, consequently, the kids really took it as a kind of badge of honour that they had Jim's whacker. And outside the, uh, one of the gates of the school, there was a, between the school gates and the annex, there was a lamp, a telegraph pole. Mm. And quite often at the end of the break, Jim would say, last round the telegraph pole and back to me, he gets the whacker. And they'd all rush round the telegraph pole and get back. And he was, just, he was, he was the same boy, always got it on, on the backside. But it was, a, it was never considered to be a punishment. It was more or less a badge of honour. But it caused a lot of laughter. It really did. Poor old Jim. Great character. <laughs> Derek Woodburn had sent some boys into what was called the orchard. Uh, to do some work. Um, I was teaching in the in the school at this time and the boys were doing something in the the orchard when they came across a bomb. It was a small bomb about let's say 15 inches long, uh, bulbous at one end, fins at the other end and it looked like a bomb. And so they rushed off to tell Derek. Derek went, it found this thing, thought it looked particularly uh, dodgy, um, and brought it back to the annex, carefully. Somebody by then had rung for the police because it was obviously considered to be a dangerous item. The police turned up, and everybody was standing around by this time, looking at this rather dangerous object from afar, and the caretaker, came on and said, oh, have you found that bomb again? The police went absolutely ballistic. What do you mean again? Well, he says it's been going around for years. They keep finding it and digging it up and finding it. Because none of us knew. Uh, none of the kids knew. Uh, so the police gave the caretaker a bit of a carpeting for you know, being so jocular about something as serious as an exploded bomb. And it did turn out to have been a hoax. It was a bomb which it had been defused and a rubber end was placed on it, which we didn't know. Mm -hmm. And um, occasionally people would bury it somewhere and leave it for maybe years and then it would be dug up and cause such a sensation as that. Very strange. <laughs> Only in Balby. <laughs> the, the staff and the pupils at Balby did seem to have a common culture if you like, um, community if you like. We were all in the same boat together. We uh, wanted the best for each other in a sense. I've taught in the sec other secondary modern schools and I've taught in a, in a grammar school and there was nothing like the community spirit in any of the other schools. Balby was special and I can't explain why. Maybe it was the staff, maybe it was the children, maybe it was the blend of both. But I got on famously with lots of the children there. They were really, really good kids, nice kids, children who you would be proud to call your own. That's the sort of children they were. And they went on, they, 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 I think they thought highly of uh, their staff as well, a lot of them, and highly of the way the school was uh, doing their best for them. They really did, and I did enjoy their company a lot of the time I was there. In fact, uh, towards the end, of my career there when I was I still used this 
um, big room at the in the annex, um, I created a little off room, uh, whatever it was used for in the past, I don't know, it was empty, and I put a carpet in there and some chairs, and some of the sixth formers used to use it as a kind of common room, and I used to go in there with them. Um, so we, we did get on quite well. One of whom, Paul Hart, uh, I was his best man at his second wedding. So that's how good a relationship we had with each other there. And um, I would say that in all the schools I worked at, until I became a head teacher, I would say the schools I'd worked in, and, and I'd worked in quite a number of schools when I was in teaching outdoor pursuits in an outdoor pursuit centre, I would go into other schools and do some work there. I never came across any of the schools with anything like the uh, community spirit that Bobby had. And I still have a great fondness for my time there. I really do. I was proud of the boys who achieved Duke of Edinburgh's award. Very proud of that. That was a, a highlight of my career. I think I was also proud of the fact that um, I moved up the ladder, as it were. Uh, I, I didn't stay with the bottom enders, as you would have called them. I moved up and eventually my, my form was, uh, I think, four alpha, one or two, one of the higher academic classes, and I got on with that lot. And uh, I think I became somebody that other members of staff uh, respected as well. I still have one of the presents the staff gave me when I, re when I left the school. Uh, it's a, a book in my, uh, in my library and uh, I shall keep it forever. Despite the fact that my wife says, why are you keeping that book? <laughs> I keep it because it's from Bowlby High School. If you would like to know more about the Aussie Through the Ages project, then please email me at Tony Armstrong 1959 at Outlook.com. Thank you.